Skate, skate culture is very interesting because、um, much like, say, a music scene or a particular subsect of a music scene,、um, there's certain fashion associated with it. There's certain locations like venues associated with it in the form of skate spots that are both you know, public spaces turned into skate spots as well as like private skate parks and things like that.、Um, there's lingo, there's dialect. And then there's magazines and videos, you know, originally VHS and then, you know, now straight to YouTube、um, or online that encapsulate all those things and present the actual act of skateboarding、um, with a soundtrack, with an outfit, with,、um, you know, spots that are introduced to you and thus cities that are introduced to you through skate photos or skate footage. So, I think skate culture is very similar to you know, describing、um, you know, your favorite music scene or your favorite kind of record label in a sense, or maybe even the, the fanfare of a popular sports team almost. Like it has its own kind of like culture and、um, iconography behind it.、Um, skateboarding frequently gets compared to an art form because of the way in which there is these graphic elements and this、um, you know, presentation and this almost rejection of traditional. Sports, but I think describing it as a culture allows someone like myself to cast a wider net and show how film and music and you know, music videos and the platforms that presented them, like an MTV or an independent film scene, cross over with skateboarding through the personnel, like people like Spike Jones, who you know is a Owns 25% of a skateboard company as well as does his, very much does his own thing as a, as a director.、Um, and how the skateboarders like, see themselves in popular culture by way of seeing Spike j o n e s direct a far side video or seeing him, you know, skaters are kind of championing some of these folks that you see in the popular culture, even a Tony Hawk,、um, amidst you know, praising the kind of core aesthetics of, you know, Skater owned skate shops and things like that. But I feel like skateboarding is like this Venn diagram that culturally overlaps with so much other stuff that、um, through Chipped, I was really trying to take a step back and articulate what it feels like as a skateboarder to see oneself represented in popular culture as much as seeing you know, the connections that we as skateboarders almost know on the back of our hands. Through like, the culture itself, like certain songs or certain skate spots evoke certain emotions or feelings or historical moments for us as skateboarders. But、um, connecting those with the like, larger moments that、um, non skaters would understand was a fun experiment、um, through this project. And trying to represent skate culture as an intersection as much as、uh, a passport or a gateway into music and cities and And other、uh, kind of other skate cultures, histories therein. Yeah, it makes me think of, like, off the top of my head, it makes me think of punk rock. Yeah. Because there's such a fashion aesthetic to it, there's such a DIY ethos at the core of it, which I feel like there are some similarities between it and skateboarding、mm -hmm. and the way in which both things grew. In a kind of grassroots way, right? I mean, it's from the ground up, these cultures. And for you, you write in the book that the first sight of skateboarding that you had in your life was in Tom Petty's fr <laughs> free fallen video. Is that right? Yeah, straight out of、uh, Ventura Boulevard. Yeah, like as the lyrics say. God, I feel old. Like that. <laughs> I, went to, I went to see Tom Petty on that tour, and Lenny,、oh, wow. Lenny Kravitz opened up for him. He was brand new at that point. Uh, but a gig. yeah, it was a, it was a great album, the、uh, Full Moon Fever tour. But、yeah. anyway, when you saw that, what was it about skating that captured you? you? I mean, were you captured right away? Were you like, I got to get aboard and go do this? I was definitely fascinated.、Um, I, was, I was still too young to like have that agency of like, I need to get aboard, you know? But I, I was definitely, I waited for that part of the music video every time it was on MTV and it was on. Heavy rotation to use a term that may not be、uh, familiar to younger listeners. But, you know, it was, it was such a big song and video、um, that I always just waited for that moment when these dudes are just catching air. And you can't even see the ramp. It's like, for us, like it, it's footage that would not be published in a skate video, like it, it, aesthetically. Like you can't see where the to and fro of like where the skater's taking off, but you see them just looking cool in the air. 
they're wearing these like kind of like different shoes and even the helmets look cool, like just different colors. But I was just fascinated of like, how does one propel yourself that way? Like, how do you, how does that happen? You know, how do you, how do you make that even happen? Um, much like watching like Michael Jordan, like hang in the air for a while, like this kind of idea of getting hang time was kind of in the popular uh, zeitgeist at the time too. So, you know, growing up playing basketball and, and watching skateboarding first, it was pretty much like Tom Petty and then maybe Clueless a couple years later and some like MTV footage <laughs> sprinkled therein. But um, wait, wait, the movie Clueless? Yeah, yeah. Tra- was that Travis Birkenstock? Was that he yeah. a skater? He was a skater, <laughs> uh, amateur bong manufacturer. And uh-huh. uh, yeah, he was a, uh, and I, I forget who, who was the actual skateboarder who was the extra in that film. But, you know, there you see like massive, extra, like um, complete, ridiculous representations of skaters right like like triple xl pants uh like everything's baggy there's chain wallets everywhere so from like you know the more literal like tom petty rep- music video representation to like this other kind of hyper extreme example um you know mtv sports was a show on on tv at the time that had a lot of skateboard profiles so it was around you know and but it was all through television first and so I, from the jump, I'm creating this kind of audiovisual relationship with skateboarding um, through kind of, you know, like mass communications or through like, you know, video. Um, so, you know, that's and that's how skaters oftentimes find the spark. If not through in real life, they find it through its representation through film and and music videos was one of them at the time. OK, so for you as a young person gravitating towards skating do you feel like you were gravitating toward it primarily as an athletic thing? Like, like seeing the guys catch air and watching them sort of twist through the air and somehow land these insane jumps or whatever. Was that the thing or was it the kind of cultural attachments like the music and the fashion aesthetic and the kind of cool of it? Skating is cool in a way that like (laughs) punk rock is sort of cool in a way that like writing I mean, I think it's cool, but it doesn't have that, like, it's like, it's got that kind of youth culture cool to it that I feel like punk rock is sort of the same way in that you can't, like, I never hear it like taken apart as being uncool (laughs) (laughs) in the way of other like cultural movements. You know, people can debate all day long about whether or not like Taylor Swift is any good. But like when it comes to punk rock, it's like, yeah, the Ramones, they're cool. (laughs) Do you notice it feels like Teflon or something? Maybe that's just my perception of it. But what was it for you that really drew you? Was it the sport of it or was it the, the cultural stuff? It was, I think it was, it was, it was all those things. It it was the fact that I could experience all those things at once and be outside was like, I think the kicker it's, it's, you can experience all those things at once, you know, new music, new friends, new, new spots, new ways to kind of engage your environment. And you can do this athletic activity that is really can, you know, immediately kind of makes you obsessed of, of just like, how do I, all right, I can do this trick, but how do I do this trick? And you start kind of figuring it out. And by way of that, you start, you know, really getting obsessed and almost like learning a new language in terms of the tricks and and understanding what spots they can be done at around your your local community. And then finding other friends who are as obsessed and, and um, encouraging you to, you know, skate with them and, and check out this band and check out this mixtape and stuff like that. So, it is this kind of culture that you step into if you're, you know, once you really start diving into it, like going to a skate shop for the first time can be a very intimidating experience, especially when you don't know what, there's no TikTok kind of giving you a a walkthrough of like, this is your local skate shop. This is what it looks like. You know, you have to kind of go in there and be present and, you know, understand what the brands are and how to set up a board. And all these things are, it just becomes this new, this new thing but i think as a kid i was very much drawn to the cool element for sure you know i mean like the clothes the fact that they listen to different music like i was already very through mtv and staying up late and trying to watch 120 minutes as much as possible before getting grounded like trying to find new bands and tuning into college radios and 
you know, just trying to find new things that were, were different. And so skateboarding really, you know, accelerated that through skate videos and, and meeting other kids that were into those kind of things. I mean, at the time too, you had a lot of party culture in LA and, and the so- South line going out at the time, like rave culture and ditch parties were super big at the time. Wait, um, did ditch parties? Yeah. So like middle of the day, just parties in an apartment complex, you had a bunch of kids ditching school and just. Oh, oh okay. A, so yeah. I thought it was like in a ditch. I was like, that yeah. sounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, in central Valley, I think in California, they have, um, I believe dirt parties where they drive out to the middle of the country in, of country and like in the dirt, just pull up a bunch of uh, pickup trucks and have a party. So there is that, but uh, yeah, like there's a lot of kind of reconfiguring of, of spaces at the time and skateboarding was, was kind of a part of that um, underground um, movements. And so I don't know, like it was, it would just looks so cool. And um, you know, it was also a time when skating was still not as accepted as it is today and there weren't as many skate parks. And so there was this kind of mystery that you wanted to figure out once you got a taste of it. And I was very much into it from, from the jump. So you talked a bit, a bit ago about how people who are getting into skating are rejecting more traditional sports. This is an outsider activity. Or it can it, be. It can be. I mean, especially yeah. so back in the day. I think it's like you say, it's grown in its popularity and in its, you know, cultural acceptance or whatever. It's an Olympic sport now, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your so, I mean, coming up. Yeah. So things have shifted, but do you have a sense of the kind of people who tend to be drawn to skating, hmm. like temperamentally? Do you know what I'm saying? Is there something <laughs> different about skaters compared to people who, say, play basketball? Oh, I don't know. It's it's uh, it's intriguing. You know, I think um, there's been a lot of talk lately about how akin, like, say, a pickup soccer match is a little more akin to skateboarding than, like, an organized soccer league. You know what I mean? So, like, if if we know that this pickup match happens at this court, at you know, a grassroots thing, you know, or at this pitch every morning at 10 a.m. And over the years, it becomes this tradition that people support. And, you know, that's kind of a traditional sports example that is akin to how skaters operate and organize themselves in terms of like skate sessions on the street, right? So it's like, it's not so much the sport, but like the organization of that sport that I think um, a lot of skaters are rejecting, you know, um, in that kind of pickup game example, there may not be a coach, you know, everyone's kind of their own coach and they get in where they fit in. Whereas, you know, an organized league very much would have a coach or, or you know, that, that type of hierarchy. Um, I think back in the day, though, and, I, and particularly in, in the generations before me in the 70s and 80s, there was way more of a violent binary between, you know, jocks and nerds or weirdos and that depending on where you grew up could get pretty violent. You know what I mean? Um, like even the Tony Hawk generation would very much, they were the only skaters at their school or, or something like that. Um, and I feel like in the nineties there were elements of that. And, but I think there was also so much other kind of cool underground stuff happening that skaters weren't necessarily as alone, you know, like punk rock was, you know, 20 years old at this point, hip hop, like more or less the same. And so there's other examples of other kind of weirdos <laughs> that are like occupying the space. You know, you have raver kids, you have B-boys and B-girls, you have like this kind of nascent new metal movement that would later become Ozfest. And then what do you know, like Cypress Hill is t- touring with like, you know, metalheads and it's the Smoking Grooves tour. You know, like there's, there's so much kind of intersections kind of going on through the popularization of previous underground forms like hip hop and even, you know, uh, punk rock turned into grunge turned into like alternative music after like Kurt Cobain's passing. So um, I don't know, like that's all to say that there was a lot of intersectionality within skateboarding at the time. And it wasn't so much a rejection of traditional, it may have been a rejection of like the coaching behind traditional sports, but um, over the years I've been surprised by how many pro skaters grew up playing baseball or grew up playing basketball and, and things like that. Now you see skaters way more embracing that and you see, you know, through social media skaters on their off time playing golf or they're, you know, 
uh, if they have, if they're sponsored by Nike, maybe they get tickets to the Super Bowl or you know some or through another sponsorship. So it runs the gamut now. But um, Thrasher actually has a really cool series called Out There. It's like this nonfiction video series that shows skaters going through rehab and stuff, more talking about injuries. And you know you have skaters that are boxers, skaters that are doing um, you know like yoga instruction. It really runs the gamut now, but. It's kind of cool to see the ways in which traditional sports and like more wellness physical activities are uh, are present within skateboarding today. You think it's more it's more accepted? I mean, was there a resistance to it? Do you think in earlier eras of skating? I think so because to your to your previous question, I think because it was associated with being a jock. You know what I mean? Or associated with being um, I don't know. There was almost like this this kind of. Uh, this like flagellation element to being a skater where it's like to keep it core, you like reject this kind of wellness or this, you embrace the self-destruction to a a very self-destructive extent, you know? Um, Whereas now I feel like whether it's mental health and, or, um, you know, physical well-being, I think there is more of an acceptance of like, if you really love skateboarding, then you probably want to keep your body in, in check as long as possible and your vices in check as long as possible to keep skating as long as possible. So yeah, that's kind of cool. That's very cool to see actually. So for you, and you touched on this uh, a moment ago, you write like many skaters, my sense of ownership and my true indoctrination into the sport began the moment I physically assembled my first board. So you talk about going into a skate shop for the first time and not really knowing your way around and having to navigate that. I guess this has gotten easier in the era of the internet and social media where you can watch a video or whatever and get a sense of it. But what is it about assembling a board that is kind of like the indoctrinating? Like there's something about, because there are different choices that you make in terms of how you build your board relative to the kind of skating that you want to do, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, and you know, like especially nowadays, there's, there's a lot more like, board length variations that are accepted you know like you know in say when i started skating in like 96 97 you wouldn't necessarily be able to find a board like shaped like the kind of single tail boards in the 80s at your local skate shop it's all popsicle boards just you know like nose and tail the traditional skateboards that we know and, and love today but it's it's more so like how do i put the grip tape this kind of sandpaper like adhesive properly on top and without getting air bubbles and how do I sand off the edges and cut them off without destroying the board or my fingers, you know, and which way do the trucks go and how do I put these bearings in? And, you know, as a kid, you, a lot of the cooler skate shops, you know, will show kids how to do the thing and and why products are designed in certain ways. And, And that's one of the benefits of being in a skate shop is ideally the folks behind the counter are showing the younger generation how to do how to you know maintain your product and how to put it together can i interrupt can i interrupt because i have a question i'm thinking like i go into a skate shop the the adhesive tape and the sanding is already done i'm buying a skateboard (laughs) why why is it incumbent upon this the kid to go like do the sanding well some uh some boards are definitely pre-assembled for that reason you know that are like you can buy just like a complete board right out of the gate but for say you're like getting into the culture and you're like, oh, I want to buy that deck on the wall. Um, you know, that deck, you, you have a variety of grip tape options now. You know what I mean? There's no pre-assembly. So there's like this kind of in- instant customization. So do you go with like the the kind of house grip tape that the skate shop offers you for free that is is okay? Or do you go for like the grippier option or do you get color grip tape? Is that cool? Will I get made fun of for that? (laughs) You know, like there's all these kind of different um, things that are, that are sold to you as a kid and kids oftentimes get the marketing that's super like the comic graphic or the bright grip tape, like all the kind of gimmicks that a lot of companies sell to you. So you're trying to, in the nineties, at least you're trying to identify like, what is the cool thing? Like, like where would the older kids get, what's like culturally acceptable or relevant. And so, you know, you kind of figure it out through failing. Like maybe you try to put the the trucks on together yourself and you put them on backwards. Like a lot of kids. What are, what are trucks? Trucks are the, uh, kind of the, uh, basically they connect the board 
with uh, through screws to the wheel. So they're kind of the axle that holds the wheels. Um, it's also the the you grind on your trucks. Um, so that kind of holds the whole board together. So if you put them on backwards, you're immediately going to notice your board turning totally improperly and basically making it unrideable. But when you're a little kid trying to figure it out, you're looking at the magazines or you're looking at the other kids in the shop and you're just trying to put it together. Yeah, but, you know, again, depending on your age, uh, you know, like, or maybe not depending on your age, but like the dudes behind the counter should be able to kind of guide you in the right direction. But it's, there's kind of this rite of passage where, you know, once you're old enough to really understand it and figure it out, um, you're kind of like almost like on your own. There's almost like this rite of passage of like, you, you can probably handle your, yourself if you're going to keep skating, like you probably should know how to do this, you know, kind of thing. So it's almost like learning how to ride a bike when you enter a skate shop sometimes, or when you're trying to put it together, your first, like say a uh, customized board, it's like, uh, all right, we're going to show you how to put this together. But what's really going to help you out is you doing this for yourself over time, which is kind of microcosmic of skateboarding in general, you know, like someone can show you how to drop into a quarter pipe, like, like rolling into it, you know, um, someone can teach you how to ollie, which is like, you know, jumping on a skateboard, but it's really up to you to, to try and fail and kind of figure it out along the way. So, you know, over time, it's you putting on the adhesive to your deck and, and then you, you can start customizing it yourself. You can start doing your own artwork on the grip tape. You can start cutting out lines to identify the nose or the tail, like whatever little eccentricities you want to express, you can begin to express them because you know how to. So what does your board look like today? Oh, I'm such a plain Jane. Uh, it's a, uh, actually I can grab it really quick if you'd like. One second. Yeah, super plain Jane. So the grip tape is like really just straight black grip tape, nothing fancy, nothing cut out. This is a board made by a local skate shop here in Sacramento. So it's like a fake trucker's ad, your local parts dealer. Okay. And some stickers on the nose. I like doing a lot of nose slides. And then, yeah, so as you can see, the trucks are pretty pretty beat up. But those yeah, are the trucks. Are. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's so, from and that's from like being on a curb or whatever. Yeah, grinding curbs, grinding ledges, things like that. Do you have a name for? Do you name your board? Do you like? <laughs> <laughs> no, but some people, <laughs> I'm sure some people do. But I definitely keep a lot of my old um, decks, the the skateboard decks. I keep, you know, because um, certain stickers will reflect certain eras or certain times or certain places you've been. So. Um, I try to keep the ones that have certain meanings, you know what I mean? Like, like say you go on a skate trip with your friends, you might want to keep that deck, but um, sometimes they just break on the session and you have to throw them out. So, so you're almost 40. I know I did the math. Yeah. You're, you're still skating. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, and you know, there's been years where I haven't skated as much for sure. You know, like in, in my thirties, there was definitely some, a couple of years before the pandemic where, Basically, like during the writing of my first book, like I wasn't skating as much as as I was now. Um, but around 2019 and 2020, I started really skating again, almost kind of preparing myself for now, right? Like getting ready for 40 and stuff. But um, but yeah, I feel in a way I feel better on my board than I did as a teen. I'm definitely not hucking myself off of like staircases and loading docks like I was in the late 90s, but. It, there's still like a proficiency and a competency that feels good, you know, at, I, at this, I kind of got to get in where I fit in. Right. You know, I can't really, I'm not going to be doing 900s anytime soon, but, uh, I can skate some curbs and uh, have some laughs and that's more mean, than enough. Do you use it as transportation? Like, do you skate hmm. to, to and from places and like, as like a kind of commute or is it more just like I go to the parking lot of the local junior high and like do tricks for a, an hour as like exercise almost it's definitely it's definitely more of like going to spots um i'll definitely when i was living in the bay area it was definitely more of a transportation tool 
I had a like what we what we call like a cruiser board where you have a uh, kind of a wider board with big soft wheels that can roll over things a little easier than your traditional like you know uh, wheels and those are great for you know little short corner store trips and things like that um here in sacramento there's a little more driving or you know riding the bus i'm trying to get into riding my bike more and attaching my skateboard to that and biking from spot to spot that looks a lot of my friends do that around uh, town and and southern california and arizona and that seems like the ticket Okay. And so you write in the book that skating led you to writing Mm -hmm. and like kind of unleashed or catalyzed this desire for self-expression that might've been percolating, but hadn't really found its form or you hadn't really figured out how to do it. I guess there might be other sports that do this for people. But I feel like this connectivity between skating and creative culture is more, it's more common for people to find their creative self in tandem with finding skating than it is, say, to find somebody who like takes up tennis and then suddenly starts like throwing clay and like making pots or something like that. (laughs) I don't hear that as much. I don't hear that as much, but like visual artists who skate or skaters who pick up a guitar that seems like a more common outcome and that was the case for you skating led you to writing skating very much led me to writing and i think you were right it was this kind of percolating interest you know like very much already getting into music and and kind of culture by way of you know whatever magazines i could get my hands on and and like mtv but skateboarding really created it really satisfied those interests. It gave them a sense of agency and kind of almost purpose, like like almost this welcoming community of, of weirdos, but also people who had their own sense of cool and represented themselves in ways that they defined themselves. And um, whether and that's very akin to punk rock and hip hop, you know, where it's kind of setting your own terms of engagement with the world. And a lot of the writers I was getting into at the time had that spatial awareness and, and social economic awareness as well. Like writers like James Baldwin and, and, you know, folks like George Orwell and um, even Joseph Heller's work at the time. So like a lot of the writers I was reading were, were kind of had this interest um, and I was able to kind of almost triangulate what they were doing with skateboarding and then skateboard writing, you know, reading, um, articles in magazines and and getting to know some of the more editorial writers at publications um, they kind of helped answer the why of like why does this thing make you feel this way like why that that kind of certain mysterious you know catalytic moment of being a skateboarder and representing yourself as a skater like why do these things matter and so um, certain editorials within skate magazines like Thrasher and Transworld helped answer that too Transworld Skateboarding had this really cool editorial called Brain Floss that was a two-page spread of artists, visual artists, who skated every issue. And so you're able to see um, this intersection as well as this um, praising of it, you know, this acceptance of it. Um, And then beginning to understand that certain skateboarders do their own graphics, if not own their own companies that are guided by their visual, by, by the visuals that they create you know, it really made art accessible and expressing oneself accessible, let alone, you know, the feeling of landing a trick for the first time or, you know, conquering a fear through this physical act. Um, You know, it's just huge amounts of agency is what skateboarding gave me during this time. You say in the book that you started writing poetry when you started skating. Yeah. Yeah. What age, what age were you at? Like 13 probably um yeah there's this one skater named kian lu um he was pro for at the time maple skateboards he had a profile in on mtv sports one time and he's this very cool figure uh, asian american man with very long ponytails like down to his like lower back and he could do these massive ollies like real big from flat you know jump over the biggest fire hydrant you know just really uh bombastic ollies 
And he also wrote poetry. He also <laughs> did spoken word. And I think he sold chat books at some of the demos that he went to. And, you know, seeing that through MTV was, was really intriguing. And I was already, when I was listening to hip hop, I noticed I was really attuned to the lyrics and, and same with even grunge music and dissecting Nirvana lyrics. I remember Heart Shape Box. I was dissecting that like a investigative journalist. Like, what does this all mean? <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, trying to figure it all out in a sense of like, what, what are these, what are all these things saying to me? And so, yeah, I started keeping a journal, just a straight up composition book and started writing like terrible love poems as well as like, wow, this thing is so cool kind of poems about skateboarding and, and, you know, in the world I was engaging with, like the different parts of my town that I hadn't necessarily seen before, or, you know, just, um, just that, again, that sense of agency, but yeah, poetry was like the almost gateway drug to writing. And it was probably a combination of hip hop as well as um, by the early 2000s, spoken word gaining, you know, a little more popularity through like HBO Def Poetry Jam and things like that. So um, PBS also had this thing called Poetic License that was this online journal for kids that I was into at the time. But yeah, like starting in junior high and then very much into high school, I started writing more poems and by the end of high school i was you know performing spoken word at local open mics around pomona and claremont college areas how much crossover was there between your skating life and the friends you made mm. like at the skate park and the like slam poets you were hanging with and performing with yeah like in high school i had like a whole other skater crew in pomona that was different than than this the skaters I knew in, in Laverne where I went to school and I met the skaters in Pomona just at skate spots, like just on the street. And so it was almost like uh, two different, two different crews. Um, I think when I got into college and really started befriending a lot of poets in the Bay area, I didn't actually meet a lot of skaters during undergrad at the time. And when I moved to the Bay area, which is very ironic given that the Bay area is such a epicenter of skateboarding. So there wasn't a lot of, crossover it was more so like um skaters who were in bands or skaters who were visual artists and did more graphic art and things like that um so you know but at the time there was still like writing in skate magazines and there was still like skaters who were trying to do poetry in an artistic way um like uh, scott Bourne was a poet or is a poet and artist who was putting out work like that but it was still kind of an anomaly, you know, secondary to say like a visual artist. Like I think those that was a way more um, understood within skateboarding culture, just given skateboard graphics and the need to have visuals, right? You're more, you're kind of more ready to uh, see that. And, you know, a lot of skaters don't necessarily read the articles in a skate magazine article uh, either. So uh, there's, there's that too. But um, so not a lot of crossover, but I think it's grown over time. So I'm going to quote you again from your book where you say, today when I meet a skater in a non-skateboarding setting, there's an immediate recognition of the lens we share, a lens that understands passions can be criminalized, that the term public spaces is asterisked, <laughs> and that space is a construct as much as time. So this word lens factors into the title of your book, right? It's, a, it's part of the subtitle, Writing from a Skateboarder's Lens. You're in this little bit that I just read, talking a lot about space and about the criminalization of skate culture and the way in which our society doesn't necessarily accommodate people who are interested in this and who might view them even as kind of inherently criminal uh, like yeah. <laughs> that's part of it right i don't know maybe it's less so now that things have become more mainstreamed and skating is an olympic sport but you talk about the lens like the skateboarder's lens and this issue of space sure yeah i think um you know i think once as skateboarders i think you uh particularly skaters who, who skate street you start reconfiguring your relationship with the built environment first and foremost you know um parking lots and say uh, parking blocks and things like that become skatable objects and places to skate or staircases become obstacles and things like that. But then there's a larger expansion of your perspective as a skateboarder that I think impacts your relationship with art, 
your relationship with music um, and, and your introduction to those things as well. Um, and it also, by way of skate spots and street skate spots in particular, you're able to see the kind of power in allowing, in, in what skateboarders can do to a space. And what I mean by that is like, you're able to see how skaters can reconfigure, say, a public plaza's original intention and almost bring it to life in a way that is different than its original intent, but also kind of, you know, symbolizes it in a in its own right too. You know, you think about Justin Herman Plaza at the Embarcadero in San Francisco in the early 90s. And, you know, skaters definitely turned that, the ledges of that plaza that was that, you know, f- during the nine to five is where people sit to have like lunches and coffee breaks. They turned those ledges into, you know, probably the most popular street skate spot in the world in the early 90s because of the innovation that was going down there because predominantly latchkey brown and black kids were there like all day figuring out new tricks and innovating and pushing street skateboarding to new heights recording it and putting it out through skate videos and so now skaters around the world associate san francisco immediately with that spot and their entire relationship with this city as a visitor, be it in person or through a screen, is immediately connected with skateboarding and, and, and everything kind of associated with it. So it becomes like this new map where if you tell anyone that's involved with skateboarding, oh, yeah, this plaza is kind of it's almost like an Embarcadero or it's almost like a Justin Herman Plaza. They immediately have an idea of what that vibe is and what that kind of potential is as a skater let alone how that plaza exists for non-skaters in in like the space of San Francisco or any city. So, you know, this kind of, the lens I speak about a lot in the book is once you, you know, really dive in and kind of commit to being a skater in a sense, you know, everything that you see not only becomes a skatable object, but you're also able to see how other cultures are intersecting with this thing that you love called skateboarding in their own right. You know, whether it's the, the, you know, the, the bartenders at the local dive bars that are friends with the skaters who, you know, book skaters to perform, you know, in their bands at their, at their clubs, or if it's the people that are in, you know, the fashion and garment industry or, or nowadays like content production that are doing, you know, the edits and documentation of skate culture and skate fashion, you're able to kind of, through the lens of skateboarding, see how it impacts all these different avenues of, you know, popular culture and and how, as a result of that, you yourself can not only, you know, learn a new trick and push your skateboarding, but here's all this other stuff that you may not have been into before that you're now introduced to through skateboarding. What can you do with that? You know, so many former pro skateboarders become professional videographers or film directors or graphic designers or visual artists and it was all sparked off of this toy um and everything that it it introduced to you through this lens so a lot of the book you know talks about jazz music and going to skate demos in real life and meeting skaters on the street and trying tricks and it's all trying to kind of represent this lens that um, I've had ever since I was a kid because of skateboarding and how it's really shaped my life then and now. So when it comes to iconic outdoor skate areas, like what is it, Justin Herman Plaza in the Embarcadero, like what are some other ones? I'm just curious. Like what are ones oh, sure. that like most skaters would know? Well, there's a uh, Machba in Barcelona. Um, it's the uh, the the ledges that are there and um, in front of the museum in Barcelona. This is uh, these are ledges that are kind of maintained by the local skaters with the kind of like a working permission with the museum um, to not skate during you know like peak tourist periods and stuff like that. But that's a very well known spot. Um, there's a lot of skate spots in in the united states that are no longer but that skaters still like recognize in the verbiage like love park in philadelphia was a quintessential uh 90s skate plaza as was philadelphia city hall across the street um one skate spot that's kind of coming back in some form in new york is the brooklyn banks which is underneath the brooklyn bridge on the manhattan side um part of that has been restored 
Um, but yeah, in San Francisco, Embarcadero is kind of shorthand for Justin Herman Plaza. Um, Hubba Hideout, which is the spot near Embarcadero that had these concrete ledges going down them. Um, the impact of that spot is that now at any skate park in the world, any kind of ledge going downstairs is referred to as a hubba. Um, so yeah, like, and maybe Jaquan on Wilshire, this, this plaza in, in, in LA, just outside of downtown, that's still a very active kind of plaza ish spot. Um, that's still in play. But yeah, I mean, these are, these are in South Bank in London is actually a great example of it's an, it's an undercroft that is arguably where street skateboarding in London really started. Like it, it's been a skate spot for, for decades and a crew of skaters created a nonprofit and worked with the city to restore the spot, preserve it and make it a legal uh, skate spot. So through the save South Bank movement, but yeah, South Bank in London is is an amazing um, street skate spot that's been preserved um, through DIY skaters initiatives. So is I guess there's like there's probably skate tourists like you want to go oh, to yeah. London. Do you do that? Do you ever like go to a place just so you can check out like a famous skate spot? Totally. Or or maybe it's like when you're in town, like what are the skate spots here? You like you know so. Uh, you know, that for a skater, maybe that business trip to, you know, Tallahassee is like may sound boring to someone, but like, oh, I can go check out this or I can check out that. But yeah, uh, skate tourism is a term that <laughs> skaters themselves even use to kind of like, when in Rome, I'll check out this kind of thing. But, but yeah, I mean, you want to see what the spot looks like to better understand what went down there. How hard is it? How steep is it? How rough is the ground? Um, you know, um, oftentimes, even if you have a board and you think you can pull off a trick at a spot, the spot humbles you upon arrival and you don't even try your tricks. So that's that's part of the allure for sure is understanding the how, you know, and that's part of what attracted all of us to skateboarding in the first place. Is Justin Herman Park like the Mecca? Like, is there like a Mount <laughs> Everest? Do you know what I'm saying? Or is there like a place that's like known as the most difficult like the highest le- degree of difficulty and like it's really the place for the the badass skaters to do their thing well with difficulty there's definitely some some skate spots that still exist that are still like proving grounds like there's a very large set of stairs and a, and and a large handrail that goes down them at hollywood high school you'll see that on the cover of thrasher and various magazines and it's still a place where skaters go and try to throw down um, NBDs, never been done. So tricks that have never been done on a popular skate spot that kind of helps your mark um, as a skater, some believe. Um, but so there's there's kind of like these proving ground spots that are still like big kind of jaw dropping. But these plazas where multiple different tricks happened and that are a little more low impact, some of them kind of remain, but their ledges might be gone, which is the case at Justin Herman Plaza at Embarcadero. But you can still see on the bricks that are there, you can still see the marks and the residual silhouettes of what once what uh, once was there. And in a weird way, it's like this kind of homage to this era that you can't you know, physically access anymore. You can't touch the ledges that were once there but you can literally still see all the marks that helped build the tricks um, that have helped define, you know, street skateboarding. So I don't know. I mean, there is like probably like, you know, the big bad handrail in skateboarding is probably Hollywood high. Um, There's certain, you know, spots like that where so-and-so did something at, at this spot, like, but yeah, Hollywood High is probably the biggest one I can think of. That's um, not far from where I am. I could, yeah. uh, I can go up there and try to break my neck. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then go to In and Out. It's right there. That's right. Just <laughs> get get carted away in an ambulance. Stop at In and Out on my way to the hospital. Uh, so helps the, uh, helps the commute. Yeah, I uh, I want to ask you in a related on a related note about skate videos because I feel like skate videos are so important to the popularity of the sport and the culture. And again, we're talking mostly grassrootsy mm-hmm. DIY kind of videos, especially nowadays. And with the, you know, the internet and YouTube, people just put stuff up yeah. and film themselves. But when you talk about these uh, plazas, you know, the public plazas where the degree of difficulty might not be as high and there's a lot of different stuff happening, 
like what you're describing to me seems like a laboratory setting almost <laughs> where people who are interested in skating and interested in um, never been done or interested in practicing and trying and testing things. That's where a lot of the innovation seems to happen because, and, and also people are seeing one another exactly. skate. And so there's like this, this feedback loop that's happening and then people take their phone out and film it, or they have a video camera, I guess, back in the day where they're filming and then those videos go up and either it's a VHS tape that gets circulated or it's something online that goes viral and suddenly thousands or even millions of other skaters are seeing what's being done and then taking what they've learned to their own little plaza or skate park, right? Like that's how it happens. So skate videos for you, huge, hugely important, especially in your youth, right? In terms of your learning about the sport and kind of deepening your association with it and refining the skateboarder's lens that you see the world through. Absolutely. Skate videos are were just like centrifugal to understanding skateboarding. And because of that feedback loop, you know, you're able to see how these skaters represent themselves and carry themselves in different environments, like different spots. And, and yeah, like these plazas, you know, um, and at these plazas to kind of um, piggyback off of this, the setting you were describing, there might only be one filmer, like one person with a camcorder at that spot at that time. So, you know, when everyone's ready to film, you as a skater have to really come correct and really be ready to like land your stuff on that go because maybe we don't have a lot of tape. Maybe I don't want to hit rewind and go back and, and try and find the spot. Uh, whereas now with a phone, you know, you have way more agency to kind of uh, do multiple tries and multiple things, but you still have that pressure of the camera the, being on you and, you know, wanting to, to make it. Um, but yeah, growing up, skate, the skate videos were also when they were VHS or DVD only and you're a kid on maybe you have an allowance, maybe you don't or you've saved up some money, whatever video you buy is going to be the video for like months. You know what I mean? So you got to really like you're looking at everyone in the shop and you're seeing all the names in the video. You're trying to figure out like what's the one. And so and this is where skate shops are so critical for being the distributors of skate videos is that they can tell you like like oh i know you're looking at this video but you might like this for these reasons you know um yeah this this is this might be a little dated this is more your style or like this you, if you like skating big stairs and handrails like a hollywood high kind of stuff this is more your scene so skaters uh people that work in skate shops almost act as like almost like librarians to skate videos in a sense what's interesting now though is when music licensing in the digital age if you don't have the music rights for the song that you want to use edited in time with your part to the cadence of your tricks and you you know that video might get taken down on youtube so the longevity of skate videos in the digital age is really coming into question and then the presentation of old vintage skate videos online is also this question too because so much of that music was pirated and you know not cleared by say like the beatles or anyone like that uh any of those estates how do we present and preserve skate videos as these kind of cultural things maybe even an educational context through some type of like creative licensing you know there's the there, I've, I've heard conversations of certain skaters working with some institutions to to do such work um, because of the need to have the right soundtrack to the right skates, skate part, um, which speaks to that intersection of audio, visual, and skateboarding that is a skate video. It's so critical to have that trinity at play because when you have like, when, a, when an edit gets taken down off of YouTube and there's no physical copy that you can go back to and say, this is the source of truth, um, it's almost uh, it's it's kind of heartbreaking, you know, as as a fan of skateboarding, you know, it's almost like if uh, your favorite song you can't listen to it on Apple Music anymore, but you still see the title is there, you know, it's it's it's, it's like uh, so it speaks to the need. A, a lot of skate companies are still putting out physical versions of their skate videos, you know, just in case something goes wrong in the digital side. Here's a DVD, or here's even a VHS that we're still making 
in limited amounts that you can get at the premiere, you know? So even when things are still shot on cell phones or uh, there's still even skate premieres, you know, in real life at, at theaters. So it just speaks to the, um, the kind of watershed moments that skate videos create for scenes or within skateboarding and, and the impact that they have. So you consider a skate video called welcome to hell, <laughs> the, the best skateboard video ever. Why? Oh, it, it was one of those watershed moments where you had this whole, you know, wave of really talented young skaters um, and some like established veteran pros um, and some real badass music and editing um, just just kind of hitting you over the head with like some of the gnarliest, coolest looking tricks that you've ever seen. And um, the whole... Welcome to Hell was made by Toy Machine Skateboards, which is owned by Ed Templeton, who's an artist and skateboarder. And when that video came out in 1996, it was one of maybe three videos of that year um, that just really kind of had a big impact on the culture. Very much so in terms of like how big of stairs you can skate, how big of handrails you can skate. It was very much like a maximalist video. It wasn't about smooth technicality. It was more just um, doing the biggest, hardest tricks that one could do. And But the soundtrack was amazing. The editing was amazing. It made them seem like absolute rock stars who look like they work at record stores. And, you know, um, and there was women in it, like Alyssa Steamer, one of the most legendary pro skateboarders who's a woman she had a full part in it and was introduced to the world through that video um so it's it was just so cool and um speaking to skaters of kind of my era who started in the mid 90s you know it was just one of those you got to watch this kind of videos if there's a skate mixtape floating around with your crew that video is definitely on it you know it was like um you know, it was almost like when a certain band enters a certain music scene and there's a before and after. That was the same with, with Welcome to Hell. And you talk about the the big swings that these skaters are taking and trying to do the most difficult tricks possible for shock value, entertainment value, you know, to get people's attention, essentially. What it brings to mind for me is the documentary that I watched on Tony Hawk. I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah. And that was an eye opener for me because I, again, like my, uh, skate life was like junior high. That was it. And I didn't get like super deep into the magazines and the videos in the way that I probably would have had I stuck with it. But when I watched the Tony Hawk documentary, it made, uh, it made the reality of the dangers of skating incredibly real to me. Like the physical punishment endured by pro skaters who are operating at the level of Tony Hawk and skating half pipes and making these inc- insane uh, jumps and, uh, you know, skating down staircase railings and all this kind of stuff, like broken bones, torn ligaments, concussions. I mean, like ruined and yet still skating. Can you talk <laughs> a little bit about the physical? Cause I don't think people realize, I don't think people the average person realizes the physical toll that skating can take on a human body. Yeah, it's really, it's really brutal. Um, And I think those dudes came up in an era where they were skating so much in terms of, you know, competition was the way you made a living as a pro in the eighties. And those dudes were competing constantly. They were doing demos um, and, you know, they really helped build the industry and, their bodies paid the price over the years. It was striking in that documentary to hear like Lance Mountain talking about the possibility of skateboarding being the reason he could die. I mean, that was absolutely shocking, you know, to hear. But when you hear, particularly in the, in the context of concussions and CTE, which we've heard a lot about in um, NFL and football and and NCAA football, um, as well as soccer, um, it's it's really not surprising to kind of, you know, to hear that. I'm glad that they included it in the documentary, and I'm glad that Tony and Lance Mountain went there and talked about it. Um, 
but yeah, it, it sparked a lot of conversation in the kind of culture of just like the obsession and just the the drive that some of these guys had and some of these guys willed upon themselves. I mean, these were some of the first superstars of skateboarding in, in the 80s and they were the kind of Wheaties box skateboarders that even to this day, 40 years later, we're still, you know, talking about um, and should be talking about. Um, but, you know, I think it was also... The, the toll is very much there. And I think as skaters, we tend to gravitate towards more low impact skating as we get older, you know, curbs, ledges, flat ground, um, ramps, like smaller ramps, not half pipes that are like 60 feet tall, but like, you know, uh, a couple feet of a quarter pipe that doesn't necessarily require uh, awling. You can kind of like muscle your way into a grind on a ramp, stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, your lower back takes a lot of the weight of the impact of say of going of, of an ollie of jumping so to speak um your ankles take a lot of beating from just the deck kind of hitting them for different attempts and learning how to fall is very much a big part of your first year of skateboarding i think like learning how to tumble and learning how to kind of defer or disperse some of the impact but i mean Folks like Danny Way, Tony Hawk, Lance Mountain, you know, people that are doing the mega ramp that you see in X Games and the people that help pioneer it. I mean, those dudes have gone through some stuff that I don't think most people could recover from. And, you know, it's not the average skateboarder, I would say, <laughs> that goes through such injuries. But, you know, you do have to be aware of how to fall as a skater. And I really recommend, and excuse me, I really commend um, those skate programs that are like, tutorial like skate after school um skate like a girl these are like nonprofits that are centered for youth as well as adults as well as you know women centered or gender non-conforming spaces um that help show people that are interested in skating not only how to skate but also how to fall how to s stretch and how to prevent you know as much kind of wear and tear as possible um because it is part of the sport and sometimes However masochistic it may sound, a good slam will wake you up in the middle of a session and humble you and make you realize, uh, next time I try, I need to be a more uh, present <laughs> in my approach. So, you know, it's part of the game, but thankfully, you know, it doesn't have to be. And you don't have to do a mega ramp to be a skateboarder or to be considered a skateboarder. Um, but, you know half pipe skating that those guys were doing is kind of unfortunately not in the Olympic games. And when you hear them talk about their injuries and stuff like that, it, you, I'm curious, like if, if Vert will have a competitive comeback and I think it should because the tricks are so cool and it's such a good competitive format. Um, just the, the back and forth of a half pipe. Um, That's not in the Olympics. No, they have like park skateboarding, which is more like bowls and transitions, which is cool. But I feel like the half fight they got to bring back and um, maybe they will in the future. Yeah. Have you been injured? I mean, I'm sure you've sustained some injuries, but have you, I mean, you, you wear a helmet when you skate these days and do you, uh, do you have like, like war, war stories about like <laughs> break, breaking your collarbone or something? No, just um, some sprained knees, um, which, you know, will take you out and put you maybe on a crutch for a couple of days and stuff, but, and a bunch of rolled ankles and let's see, some fractured wrists, but that's about it. No torn <laughs> meniscuses or anything like that, knock on wood, but um, I don't wear a helmet, but as I get older, I've definitely considered it and um I don't knock anyone that does. Uh, but yeah, I, yeah, no, no, no helmet for me. Although I'm not jumping downstairs or anything like that anymore. I'm definitely on the curbs and ledges, uh, regiment. So a little more low impact for me these days. So yeah, not as far to fall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, or, or, just my as, height. or as fast. Like you're not going, I mean, if you're going downstairs, if you're trying to somehow pull some trick and skate down a stairway railing, like you're flying, right? That's fast. Yeah, and even if you start slow, you're you're going down fast. You know, just gravity is is increasing that velocity pretty quick. So, oh yeah. All right. Well, I'm not going to be doing anything like that anytime soon. <laughs> uh, one thing I want to talk with you about before we part company has to do with music. 
Sure. We talked earlier about like the relationship between punk rock culture and skate culture, the kind of like natural affinity that exists there. But one of the things that I was somewhat surprised to read about in your book is the relationship between jazz music yeah. and skating. Like it's not maybe the most natural thing that people might expect. And yet John Coltrane has a pretty big audience in the skate community. Like his work really resonates with skaters. And as I read that and thought about it, I was like, oh yeah, I guess like with jazz music and with a guy like Coltrane in particular, there's a kind of wild improvisational spirit that crosses over. Is that accurate? Yeah. There's like the improvisation amidst like a known melody is very much akin to a skater approaching a skate spot a certain way like if if the skate spot is like how a song is played or is is the, is the kind of consistent melody then how a skater approaches it is almost like a soloist amidst a song um but i think like the big thing was you know jazz was introduced was or john uh, uh this kind of red garland trio featuring john coltrane was introduced to a lot of skaters through the vi the um, video Video Days, which came out in 1991 and featured Mark Gonzalez, arguably one of the most influential street skateboarders ever, doing some, you know, never been done kind of stuff on the streets of California and Paris and London to the sound to the soundtrack and to this um, to the part in the song where, where Coltrane is soloing, and so like immediately culturally the best street skateboarders identify with one of the greatest jazz musicians of all time through this skate video that was directed by Spike Jones, actually. Um, so I think immediately that, was, that kind of broke down some of the barriers of is jazz cool within a skateboarding context for skaters, right? And from there, you know, the other day I was at um, the parking lot at Rockridge Bart in Oakland and they were blasting John Coltrane as they were skating like a, a weekend session. of, And it's just like... I think jazz unleashes this, um, the sonics of jazz is something you can't ignore, much like the sonics of street skateboarding. Like it's loud, there's kind of a, a cacophony to it. It's intentionally designed to be almost like bombastic in nature at, at points um, and to be self-expressive in that through like solos and things like, and, and uh, that improvisation. Um, but I feel like through skate videos, it pops up at these different times. And when you hear a jazz soundtrack in a skate video, it throws even skaters a curveball because it's, again, to your point, it's not what you would expect. You're expecting maybe a Tribe Called Quest or maybe you're expecting uh, Seven Seconds or some punk rock, right? But, you know, the kind of uh, application of jazz and skateboarding is done in these very thoughtful moments that I was trying to express in this essay called King Shit, which kind of triangulates Sun Ra, the jazz composer and musician with Jackie McLean and John Coltrane and other examples of jazz that have inspired me and intrigued other skaters as well, because I feel like there's a similar journeyman quality to the jazz musicians where they're obsessed with the form, they're obsessed with knowing the standards in order to riff and find other new kind of forms of music and, and new sounds and that search and that, you know, and the pursuit therein is to me very emblematic of what it feels like to be a skater at times when you're just kind of obsessed and, and, and not only want, but kind of need more and, and, you know, want to take the steps to find it. I think it's really cool the way in which a, a subculture like skating can embrace like the music of John Coltrane or the music of Sun Ra in a way that's kind of surprising. You're like, oh, wow. And I think it might even be surprising to John Coltrane where he's still alive. Like, oh, I had no idea my work was going to resonate so much with people who were like skating down at the Embarcadero or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then I start to think about the rights issue, this music rights issue, which I think is legitimate. Like I get that totally. musicians deserve to be paid for their work. And, you know, if it's just a free for all, they're going to lose a ton of money. And yet, I think the fact that these skate videos, just as an example, incorporate John Coltrane music probably benefits him greatly mm -hmm. in the aggregate. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I like how if, if the, a, 
there's anecdotal examples of that too in in with hip hop where certain hip hop groups will meet a bunch of skaters and they'll be like the hip hop musicians will be like oh we heard you guys used our song but it's all good cuz now all the skaters know us you know and now all you guys are here and so it's it's funny the gray areas of that kind of guerrilla marketing via pirating if you will I think you should make a skate video of yourself and play this episode over the <laughs> images. Why not? Uh, I got to get some footage. I got to get some clips. I got to yeah, document myself. You got to head down to the Embarcadero and go for it. Just try to re refine your youth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, um, well, it's really fun to talk with you. This is not a conversation I have had on the other people show, a conversation mostly about skating, right? I mean, it's about other things too, but that's what this book is. And I think it's central to your life. I think it's central to California culture, which I know is a big theme for you, uh, at least in the books that you've published so far. We talked when your last book came out. And uh, I always ask people at the end if they've got another thing cooking. Like, is there another book in this sort of vein that you're working on? Kind of. Like, I'm figuring out uh, another nonfiction project is kind of how I've been describing it. It's... Uh... Just doing a lot of research for it, but um, is, it really is it California based? I mean, is it? No, it's not going to be California based. I think that's the that's the challenge I'm putting on myself. Yeah. Any other hints? No. <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. I, I'm. I get paid. I get paid big money to ask that question, but I respect that you don't want to answer it. <laughs> but thank uh, you, though. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really it's really fun to uh, see you again and to talk with you. And congratulations on Chipped. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure being here, Brad. Thank you. 